Fantastic. All right, so we're live. Welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm here with Paul from Sierra Sports, and we're just waiting for people to load up into the webinar. Hi, Paul. Uh, so usually, yeah, it takes a couple of moments for people to load up into the webinar. So while we're waiting, um, just introduce yourself. Let me know where you're uh, calling in from. Uh, that'd be fantastic. And uh, and just let me know that you can hear us and that you can see us, because sometimes we get a few moments into the webinar and suddenly it's like we can, there's no audio. So just let me know uh, whether you can see and hear us. Um, so it's fantastic. It looks like we've got a few people already loaded up into the webinar. So just like I mentioned, introduce yourself. Let you know. Let me let me know where you're calling in from, uh, and perhaps something that you want to get out of tonight's webinar. That'd be awesome as well. So we've got some great content, very excited about this. Uh, we've been working with Paul from Sierra Sports, well, since since we met at a Peaks Challenge Falls Creek event quite a few years ago, didn't we, Paul? Yeah, I think it was five years ago, the Three Peaks. That's our first meeting, and then obviously yeah. it took some time to develop some ideas, but that was yeah. the, the first point, yeah. Yeah, so it's been a fantastic joint venture. So, of course, my name is David Heatley from Cycling Inform, and Paul is the director of Sierra Sports and Tours. Now, Paul is based over in Spain, so we're actually talking to him. What time is it over there, Paul? I'm the, I'm the lucky one. I've got the mid-morning, so it's easy for me. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. All right, I'll just, um, I'll just turn on the chat. Yep, fantastic. So just like I mentioned, don't be don't be afraid to chat. Certainly, by all means, answer, uh, ask any questions that you have uh, while we're on the call. Because obviously, I'd hate for you to get to the end of this webinar and uh, and feel like you didn't get anything out of it. So certainly, do engage with us and ask as many questions as you want, and that way we can make it tailored to yourself. So certainly, by all means, there's a, there'll be a there's a little chat window on the right hand side, and just certainly chat away. So we'll get into the slides. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, just give us a moment while I turn that on. All right. Yeah. Hey, t hey, Tim. How are you from Perth? It's a little bit earlier over there. Peaks Challenge, uh, Falls Creek in August. Oh, was oh okay. Peaks Challenge. Not too sure what that is. Anyway, so uh, so the agenda tonight. Uh, we're obviously doing a little bit of an introduction. We've done that, uh, and Paul's going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the other clients that have joined his tours. Uh, a general exploratory style explanation. The Dolomites. We'll go into the Dolomites, Pyrenees, the French Alps. Some of the, some amazing riding over in Europe. Uh, training approaches. Uh, a general tour of preparation from Paul's point of view. And then some travel options and questions and answers time. And uh, then of course the office. Um, Yep, Rosemary and David from Adelaide. Fantastic, Rosemary. So that's the agenda tonight. Now, if you've got a fuzzy screen or it drops out, uh, sometimes that happens. We've got a fantastic MBN connection here in Adelaide, and uh, Paul looks like he's on a fantastic internet connection. But certainly, if you do have any issues with your connection tonight and the screen goes fuzzy or it starts dropping out, just uh, please stop the session and then restart it. There should be a little button at the top of the screen top of your screen to stop and start the session and you'll go straight back into where we are currently in the webinar. Now also uh, on top of that just make sure you do free up the internet bandwidth if you are running on a lower bandwidth. Certainly if you've got your kids running Netflix and, and there's stuff happening in email and Facebook and five mobile phones connected to the same internet connection that you've got running at home, then you may experience some issues with this webinar because it is video, fairly video intensive. So uh, so it may mean you need to cut, kick the kids off Netflix or anything like that. So uh, <laughs> just, just really to do that. Cycling is more important, David. <laughs> Cycling is way more important. All right, so now that we've got that sorted out, so we'll just go into a quick introduction. I mean, obviously, like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I've been working with Paul for quite a few years. We've gone over and done a few of your tours. We did, we did the Volta, we did the Spring Classics, and we did uh, this year. We did um, what did we do? <laughs> we were in France. It's been such a big year. Yeah, I know. It seems like so long ago, but we went to the Dauphiné as well. We have a fantastic time on Paul's tours, and it's just awesome. Uh, I think one of the main highlights, I mean, uh, Spain was amazing uh, and uh, Paul has a fantastic ability to be, get you out on nice, quiet, awesome uh, alpine roads, so it's just amazing. We did uh, Alpe d'Huez uh, uh, this year, 
And I think one of the biggest highlights for me was doing the Paris Roubaix Grand Fondo. Well, it's not called a Grand Fondo because it's uh, run in France, sportif. so they call it they call it a Sportif in France. Um, and uh, I've always wanted to ride the Paris Roubaix. Never wanted to race it, and uh, me and Jody and Paul we had a fantastic ride, and it was an awesome, awesome day to arrive in the Velodrome, get our medals, and and just uh, have a fantastic you know, time soaking up the ambience. And then then um, we were able to watch the stage the following day. And, of course, that year uh, there was a pretty special cyclist that won it, wasn't there, Paul? You remember? Yes, I remember. <laughs> I've just <laughs> I've forgotten Matthew his name. <laughs> That's right. Matty the Aussie Hayman connection, yeah. The Aussie After connection. all those years working for other teams, he got his day to do yeah, it for himself. It, it was yeah, great. you know, and uh, it was just fantastic, you know, seeing, seeing him line up in Boonin and... You know, we were there and it was just awesome. So anyway, so fantastic um, finish for the tour. So, um, Paul, do you want to sort of introduce yourself a little bit about um, your background and just some of the experience that some of the CI riders have had on your tours? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So, yeah, my name is Paul DeAndre. So I'm Melbourne born and bred, but uh, the last 10 years I've been spending a lot of time in Spain and, and Europe as a whole. The last five years we've been 100% based in, in Spain now with a young family. So... That's just working really well for us. And we've just, every year by year, built on, on the tours and the different things that are available. Obviously, there was always a, a very strong pro angle because a lot of people love to see the, the, the classics, the Giro, the, the Tour de France, La Vuelta. And that's great, but then also we always knew we needed to have these other tours, which we call Explorer. Sometimes they also need to mix a, a Grand Fondo event just because it's a pro race is intensive. There's lots, lots of uh, days, lots of waiting around at times. And Explorer style, you can just be on your bike and doing all those amazing locations and rides, but with no time pressures. So that's where we've got that capability of offering all, I guess, tour style angles mm -hmm. to, to meet whatever different clients' interests are, which is working really well. And that's where... I guess some of the Explorer style, I got that challenge element to them with no timing pressures, of course, but the Cycling Inform members were seeing a really strong interest there. There's obviously always some who still want to come to the Tour and the Vuelta, but the biggest percentage is for sure coming to Pyrenees, coast to coast, Dolomites, and uh, we've put rolled out a new French Alps one, which we're going to introduce tonight just for something a little bit different next year as well. Fantastic. So I hope um, I hope some of this content inspires uh, the people on this webinar tonight to to go out there and you know and really explore Europe because I mean it's fantastic riding around Australia, but it wasn't until I got over to Europe and started riding around in Europe it was just the riding's just so amazing over there and you know everything that everybody says about it when they you know you see people going over for their overseas holidays and uh, to ride around some of these amazing rides. And it's just an amazing experience. So um, so I hope that some of the content that we have tonight will inspire you to get out there and, uh, and look at tour options. So, all right. So, Paul, do you want to talk a little bit about the general Explorer Tour and style explanation? I know you covered it off just yeah. very briefly. Yeah, touched on a little bit there as well. Going back to what you said about the European angle as well, it's the... The chance when you do an explorer style, you get that local contact as well because we're not in a rush. So you, you pull in for a coffee, you have a, a lunch stop, and the locals are just amazed that New Zealanders, Australians are here riding on the other side of the on the world and doing it as a holiday. And they just they're so and I might not be able to even talk with you, but they're just so amazed by that they do their best. And there's this cultural exchange as well, which is is really a lot of fun. I just thought I'd add that after hearing what you said before. Fantastic. But, yeah, basically the, the style is that where we get up, we have our breakfast, uh, and we get going. So there's no there's no rush. A lot of the breakfast things here in Europe are a little bit slower than, than the early morning rise in Australia. So we get up and we get going after breakfast. And, again, we're not trying to leapfrog a pro race. We're not trying to cut over a, a, a police road closure. So... There's often not that rush, that sense of rush. We get out, we ride, we do a, a, a stop for some food, a coffee. We ride up, have a picnic lunch somewhere in a nice, beautiful scene, scenery, and then we continue. And usually by mid-afternoon, we've finished the ride, whereas 
often with a pro style tour, you're now trying to wait around and see the pro action. So yeah. that mid afternoon finish gives a lot more time to do some nice excursions with wineries, just relax, walk around the town, some guided walking tours at times. And then just rest. That's really good time to rest and recover for your body as well, rather than still getting to the hotel late, sometimes from a transfer after seeing a pro stage. So there's some of the pros and cons of uh, between one tour style and the other. And the Explorer style for many people wins on that front because they do get the chance to also visit the towns that they're staying in and feel like they're getting that cultural part of the trip as well. So that, that's probably the main difference yeah. between the... Yeah. Styles. between the two yeah well certainly uh well when we did the spring classics it was, that would be more of an explorer although we did see a yeah. couple of a sub couple of races because we obviously wrote saw the paris yeah. roubaix um and we were kind of chasing stuff whereas uh i don't think i've done a pure explorer tour with you paul so it'd be good no it but you're right that, yeah. Yeah. yeah you're right the spring classics is a real it's a hybrid yeah and we put it on our pro races banner Mm -hmm. because there is Tour de Flanders and Paris-Roubaix yeah. that we're doing sportives and seeing the, the race live. Yeah. But that whole five days in the middle between, or five or six days in the middle yeah. between races, it's over to us to take you to some of the World War One commemorative fields, yeah. Yeah. Uh, IPA, um, mm -hmm. ceremony, yeah, beer tastings. There's all sorts of great things on that tour because it's it it's allows us to do like a hybrid tour in that situation. So you have seen yeah. Explorer mm. probably through the Classics tour. It's, yeah. It's true. yeah, and it was fantastic being on those cobbles. Like, oh, it's just amazing. And of course, Jody in the in France was just so much faster than me. And when we were doing the Bergs in Belgium, I mean, they're so different, uh, such a different style of riding to ride. Yeah over the Burks in Belgium and then the cobbles in France and the Paris Roubaix, you know, they're really, really different. So, you know, as a consequence, I was good on the Burks and Jody, my wife, she was just fantastic. I think she took like 15 minutes out of me in the sectors yeah. in the Paris Roubaix. It was fantastic. I think, I think we did 17 of the 27 yeah. uh, Parve sectors. Yeah. And obviously we regrouped at the end of each sector so we could all just uh, ride how we wanted to over them. But yeah, Jody, when you looked at the combined time, it was a lot quicker. Very good. <laughs> it was just amazing. Anyway, all right. Well, let's get into the Dolomites, Pyrenees, and French Alps. Now, these are the these are the tours, and we'll we'll gloss over them because they're really exciting. These are the explorer tours that you offer, and these yeah. are the tours that uh, a lot of our riders from Cycling Inform are going over to do. So, so let so look. I'll I'll let you, Paul, run through these. So here's the Pyrenees coast to coast. Looks like Paul might have dropped out just then. We'll just check where he's gone. He might rejoin us. Oh, he's back again. Yep. So sorry about that. He's just he just dropped out for a moment. We'll just give him a couple of moments to just reset his screen and stuff. He'll be fine. He should drop straight back into the session. There he is. He's back again. Yeah, I'm not sure when you turn the file on, it seemed to drop me out. Drop me, drop you out. Anyway, that's okay. <laughs> back in this the, is sorry the, about this that. Is the, back into the real world. That's good. Yeah, yep. No, you were mentioning there's obviously a, a lot of Explorer style ones. We also have Costa Brava, which is um, near Girona, where a lot of cycling pros set up their base. We Slovenia and Swiss Alps and the like. But the ones that were really getting heavily, I guess, involved in, and own it and signing ups from cycling form mm -hmm. is Pyrenees coast to coast as a starter. So yeah. we've called it our coast to coast. We start in Barcelona, which is obviously a, a fantastic location for tourism in general and finish in San Sebastian, which is a, another gem of Basque country. Mm -hmm. So you sort of coast to coast comes from there, but we do a couple of our um, drive transferred from Barcelona to get right into one of our favorite and unknown sort of cycling areas on the Spanish Pyrenees. Yeah. And we spend a couple of days in Wesco riding through some beautiful canyons and really quiet gorges and quiet roads. And then we cross into, you see Alcazar, Boltania, and then we cross into the French Alps, into saint Marie, yeah. which is saint Marie and Argelles, Gazost, are two of our favorite uh, midi Pyrenees bases for cycling. With two or three nights in each of those locations, you can ride 
you know, four or five quality climbs, and they're not always Tour de France climbs. We know really a couple of great ones up to 2,000 meter plus reservoirs and up to old glaciers, Tremousse, which the Tour de France can't get to because of un unable to get permits to go up there into these pristine environments. So we do our uh, tour getting those best French to Tour de France helps, but adding uh, some good um, variety as well. And then we cross back into Spain again because on the way to San Sebastian, there's just this great area near Nasaba, which is the Arati Forest, so close to Pamplona. And it's got, again, it's a dream location, so quiet. It's basically almost feels like you're in the Dolomites, but without the, the heavy traffic, which is just obviously a huge plus. Yeah. And it's also the training ground where Miguel Indurain from Pamplona wow. used uh, all the roads. So there's endless opportunities for us there. We can put optional rides in depending on how everyone's going for their levels, but we can also tailor make the rides to make them a little bit easier depending on each group who's on any given year. And then it takes us through to San Sebastian, which with the Concha Beach and the beautiful tapas and what they call them pinchos in Basque countries, but with the old town and the, beach and the beach and the bars, it's just a great way to finish. And, and many people decide to select another two or three nights just and travel on their own and enjoy San Sebastian before moving on. So it's one of these really great tours where you're mixing, I think the, the cycling form, there's the challenge angle that people have really taken note of because they do get some Tour de France history, but they know they're going to get some extra secrets. Mm -hmm. And there's the challenge. There's also the fact that they're going to get equal time in Spain and France. And really, I guess, the French Pyrenees uh, get all the hype. But many people uh, got more well when they've seen the Spanish Pyrenees when you go to the right spot. So yeah. that's a really great tour. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Fantastic. All right. So here's one of the here, one of the rides that you've got there in this particular yeah. tour. So there might be eight rides, but this is one of the classics, which is cut from three or four years ago. Started to roll out as, as a couple of the climbs in a Queen stage. And for it's basically links two of our favorite uh, bases in the Pyrenees and the French Pyrenees being saint lary soulon and argelis Gazost. And it's some people decide on this tour to skip the first climb as an optional and, and ride the last 70 oh, and save themselves for Tourmalet and through to the hotel. But those who want to do a little bit extra from the hotel, hotel ride, they can also do Orquette de Anquizan, which is a veer off cold spin. Most people have heard of Cold Our Spin, and it's one of those probably 30, 40 Tour de France passings, yeah. and it's often used. But you can veer off and don't have to take Cold Our Spin to get to Tourmalet Base. And it's this, this beautiful, green, lush valley with donkeys and all sorts of wow. yeah. uh, animals. It's just quiet. It's really great. And that's what we like to, to do. And people who get that double, it's sort of like this classic Coles Day, we call it, and it's a, it's a fantastic ride which can be pointed from hotel to hotel. Fantastic. Yep. All right. That's so, just one of many rides, but that's just one we decided. But you can see a sort of an idea of what could be a day on tour here. Yeah. Fantastic. And this looks like an awesome area with a little bit of a shadow there on the, on the, on the shoreline. And who's this yeah. guy here? Yeah, this is uh, one of those days where, you know, you, you can, you just get lucky and you got Miguel in Duran, the five time, uh, Tour de France winner, Spanish celebrity, Spanish legend, basically. Mm -hmm. And he, as I said, lives in Pamplona, and this is near Formigal, which is on the Spanish side of the Pyrenees, and uh, our group was able to ride with him for one day. So that was obviously just before the final climb. There's this beautiful reservoir, and then we had to stop to have a bit of a, a drink, and Miguel pulled over as part of the group and got some photos as well, and we then continued on up to the ski station which is a beautiful spot in Spain. Awesome. All right. Just remember, people, if you've got any questions about tonight's webinar, just don't hesitate to ask them. Just use the chat on the right-hand side of the screen. And like I mentioned, I'd hate to get you, have you get to the end of the webinar and feel like you haven't learned anything out of tonight's session. So certainly, by all means, uh, fire away with those questions, and we'll certainly be ask, answering them a little bit later on tonight. Fantastic. So we'll go to the next screen. All right, so this is Dolomites in Summer. Yeah, we've obviously Dolomites in summer because when you see the Giro race over these 
not only Dolomites, but also the Stelvio National Park. Often they, they end up having to change the, the stage or they're riding through three to four metre snow walls. And yeah. so we call it Dolomites in summer. We like to go at the end of July. So that's having a bit of sun on the back often helps because even though we call it Dolomites in summer, you might be riding in the valleys and it might be high 20s nearly 30 but on top of Stelvio it still might only be five degrees and windy and all of a sudden you're changing from one set of clothing to another to be able to do the descent so it is still summer but you can get all weather extremes when you're up 2500 2700 meters elevation so this is another one though where we have had some good uh, cycling form interest Um, basically again there's there's challenges there but the way we like to structure this tour, it gives the chance to actually many times that people ride into form because the way we structured the first couple of days, a good warm-up introductory rides in the Prosecco wine region. So lots of undulations, depending on the group, we can throw in uh, Monte Grappa, Thessan, San Boulder, which are Giro climbs, but we can also just ride undulation rides to get to get the group going if that's what we think is required as well. So from there, that gives you the good warm-up to then get into the foothills of the, the Dolomites. You start getting into Cortina, D'Ampezzo, and from there you've got Sala Ronda, Paso Gel, Fede. The list goes on and on. Mm-hmm. And again, having a few good days there means that you've got chance to, to assess any weather conditions, do certain rides on a certain order, change the route if we have to, but having three good nights there allows all those rides usually to get done, which is great. Yeah. And then it's called Dolomites, but obviously you don't go to that part of the world and, and skip on Stelvio National Park as well. So we have a couple of hour van transfer usually just to get ourselves into the Bormio region. And Bormio, if we talk later about cycling bases, is another just great spot to have a cycling base as a general holiday and ride all those Stelvio, Mortirolo, Garbia. It's not easy cycling. It's definitely up and down sort of cycling, but it's a great base. And we go in there for a couple of nights just to make sure our guests always want the challenge of uh, having the Stelvio and yeah. also the Garbia. And Garbia, even at Giro time early June, it's often closed. It's hard to get to, but in mid to late July, it's sort of got its own microclimate. Even in summer when we get to the top and it's great weather, it sort of always seems to rain in the last kilometre. So at yeah. the end of July, that's still the best window to go. So we do that. And, and again, we always like to try and finish in, you know, just a great uh, location. And Lake Como, everyone from yeah, was- tourism knows about Lake Como. And it's also got Giro de Lombardia history, one of the five yeah. cycling monuments. And we, mm. you know, Sermano and, and the Gishalo climbs right at the doorstep of our final hotel with amazing views over the lake. And it's just, again, a great way to celebrate a finish of, a, of an Italian tour, Italian Alps tour as such. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. And you've got one of these stages here. So this looks yeah. pretty challenging. Yeah, it's, 50, this, 50 one, this one I like to put up. It's not saying that it's the most complete rides where, yeah. you you know, you do a warm-up in a valley, you do a climb, another descent, a valley a climb, and you maybe get 100 k's and you might do 1,500 metres of climbing or 2,000. But this one's just – I also put this one to show a story as well that in, in Europe you don't look at the kilometres that you ride on any day. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it says an itinerary 50 or 60 kilometres because some people go, oh, only 50 or 60? Because yeah. this uh, Stella Ronda loops, it's used in the Maratona de Dolomites Gran Fondo as part of the mm-hmm. loop. They also add Paso Gel. But this Stella Ronda is the four climbs around the the, 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 the uh, Ronda, the Sala Massif, sorry, mm. and you do the four climbs and it's just only 50 k's, but you've got 1650 of elevation. Yeah. And for many, it's still a four to five hour ride because, mm. you know, you have a little break to regroup at the top, you descend, you go again, and it's just this really strange profile, but a great day on the bike and proof that you don't have to ride long distances and you're just in this amazing landscape where you've got the sort of scraggy white dolomite cliffs all around you all, the, all day and these green lush meadows all around as well so it's just beautiful sort of fairy tale type cycling if you have to 
describe it, yeah. Fantastic. All right. So we'll go to the next one. Oh, here we go. Stelvio Pass, the iconic ah, yeah. Stelvio Pass. I've got to get my photograph of this. It just looks amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, and it is. It's, uh, many people come on, on this tour knowing that it's day five or six and they pace themselves knowing that this is the, the cherry. <laughs> this is what they're going for, the cherry on yeah. the top. So, yeah. And basically it's a 25, 26K climb. Uh, it's from this side, this is um, 48 switchbacks, I think, from memory, 48. But the first 12Ks, you're up along the river, in the stream, uh, some switchbacks through the forest, and then you get to about 12Ks to the finish and you do this little right-hander and all of a sudden you can see the, the top of the climb up in the distance where you got to still go to and all the switchbacks and it's just that's when this amazing... Uh, scenery and wow factor comes in off to the left you're seeing glaciers mm. up in the distance still and it's just sort of you've got distractions all the time to sort of get you up and the hairpins flatten out at times to give you a bit yeah. of a breather and it's a really well modern engineered road so lots of sevens and eight percents consistently so yeah. that's why many people are scared about stelvio but they make it because mm. once they find their pace their and their patience and they just do what they they know they can do. Might take somebody two hours and another person two and a half or whatever, but it's okay. You, you pace yourself and you and you make it. And then there's so many spots like uh, Michael here took a photo yeah. to make sure on the switchbacks to capture the memories as well, where you can have a little yeah. breather and make sure you get that photo before you yeah. get to the top. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, Angela's asked a question about training. We're going to come to that a little bit later yeah. on. So, so we'll definitely get to it. Don't, don't worry. All right. So it just looks awesome. And I'm really looking forward to getting over and doing this particular climb. I'm like, I could just imagine myself coming up these. It's kind of like yeah. a little bit like Alpe d'Huez, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, it yeah. Flattens out with the switchbacks and then straight into sort of 6%. And we, you know, we're, like I was riding my compact crank set and it was like, you know, you get a nice 32 and to yeah. gear on your back and a compact crank set and it's like all these gradients are become a lot easier so you know it's not really necessary about the gradient but more about um you know the gearing you've got on the bike if you're over geared and you, your gears are too hard you'll find that a lot of these climbs become quite challenging and they wear you down whereas if you get some good gearing on your bike you can just literally spin up even on really steep gradients so yeah. you know, certainly bear that in mind all right so we're going to go to the next screen here fantastic Grenoble to nice the french alps Ah, yeah, this is, this is, I mean, we've, all these climbs we do in our tours at different uh, Tour de France or a different French Alps tour, but this one we've all, we've made a combined. It's a special, I guess, release for, for next year. And it's also, our philosophy generally on the tours is to have at least bases where there's two or three nights in each base because we like to show off the regions that we go to as well and get that I guess, food and, and wine experience, cultural experience as well. But there's also, it's nice to have one tour on your web page, which is a bit of a point-to-point -point mm -hmm. challenge. And this is the one that we've put in for 2020. There's already some good interest. And it's basically starting in Grenoble, which is by many the capital of the French Alps, Lyon Airport, great access by train, or from Paris, you can get the fast train as well. So Grenoble yeah. is a really good spot to enter. The, the French Alps, and then we do this route where we start to tick the box with Alpe d'Huez, Crocs de Fur, we go around to Annecy, uh, the great climbs around Lake Annecy, and then we come around the back towards Col de Saran, which is the highest um, mountain pass in Europe, and from there you get all along the Italian border. We can go up to Mont Cenis and see, just cross into Italy just to see the top there, and then some are more the giants with Galibier and Isouard with so much Tour de France history. Mm. And then Bonnet, Col de Bonnet, hasn't been used all that often in the Tour just because it is a bit out of the way, but it's a great recreational climb up to nearly 2,700 as well from wow. memory. And they even built the car park there, offered up, up a little bit higher to so-called beat Col de Saran. So there is some rivalry there in the French <laughs> Alps. It's not, Saran is the highest pass, but Bonnet's the highest asphalted road in the French Alps, but that's just, okay. you know, yeah. yeah. And then from there, we're all looking to get our way on some quiet roads down to the Côte d'Azur with those beautiful beaches along 
uh, Nice and the like, and it's a great, again, another great spot to have a few more days and enjoy yeah. your, I guess, achievements of doing yeah. an amazing thing. And, and this ride, it's probably, it's, yeah, I can't lie, it's the hardest one we've got on, on the program, but it's point to point. You feel like a pro, I guess, more day there because you're moving one hotel to the other. Yeah. It's not our typical tour, but for those who are who have done a hout route or are interested in doing a hout route, but maybe a little bit scared about the ex professionals yeah. and the racing aspect of it and the timing and am I going to get kicked off the road, etc. Mm. This is a tour where there's none of that. It's all supported, yeah. also yeah. helping everybody through, and, and you can do a hout route of mm. some, in terms of thinking about the concept, but with no pressure and support. Yeah. So it's, I think it's a great itinerary. And it's, you know, we're rolling it out for 2020 and it's likely that it might get onto our annual roster. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Oh, well. Fantastic. Excellent. So here's one of the here's one of the rides on that tour. Which one are we going to uh, yeah. this is the This would be the hardest ride if you right. did the full yeah. ride on that whole trip. Yeah. So basically, thousand. for any given explorer type style tour, the, the average day, an easy day would be a thousand meters of climbing, and the average would be 1500 to 1750 of climbing a day. This one, this being the Grenoble Tunis, more days are around the 2000, 2250 as an average. So it's got that little bit more, just because the French Alps do get up to higher elevations and they are typically anywhere from 5 to 10K longer climbs in the Pyrenees. So it is a, got that extra climbing factor but you can because it is a fully supported event you can a tour you can still decide whenever you like to opt out and yep. get some help in the support van or, or, or the like so this one if you did the full ride including Alpe d'Huez and then Col de Sarin which is the back road to Alpe d'Huez and there's two or three back roads but this is I guess the one more, more famous from the Tour de France where every now and then they roll it out uh, this would be a big day Correct, yeah. three thousand meters, yeah. but it's not yeah. it's not yeah. the normal because when you think about people who do three peaks challenge and you got four thousand plus of me, that's a that's a tough day. And usually yeah. we find two thousand meters a day for seven <laughs> to ten consecutive rides, and maybe yeah. a rest day thrown in there yeah. with a massage from one of our guides who come on there these explorer style tours. Most people are, are, are really feeling pretty good still, but riding into form. Never yeah. don't go out too fast. Yeah, oh, I was gonna I was gonna mention that. It's one of my golden tips for riding these things. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So here's one of the climbs. This looks awesome. Which one's that? Ah, oh, here's one yeah. that's actually the taken from one of the, yeah. the back roads off Alp Doors. That's right. okay. Pasta La Confession, which is not Sarin, which was in the profile you saw. It's another okay. yeah. back road and that's looking over to a few of the the 21 switchbacks or hairpins, yeah. wow. and it's just um, as, is as that, you is that the one that we came down off when we did our tour? Yeah, but that's the photo coming from what we came down, looking to what you rode up on. Yeah, yeah, because right. I remember I remember the valley up here. It was just a stunning area yeah. for riding. Anyway, yeah. So that's just uh, fantastic. Where's taken from the side angle? Yeah. yeah. All right, so, uh, so training approaches. So we'll talk a little bit about training approaches and this, this is where I kick in and talk about it. So the, f the first thing, and Paul's just alluded to it, is that when you do finally get to the tour, it's incredibly important to just ease yourself into it. A lot of people get kind of really excited and, and the advice that I give everybody that's riding a tour or whatever overseas, even on our training camps in Bright, is like just ease yourself into it and just take the you know first couple of days nice and easy and that way you actually build yourself into some fitness. Um, I know that when people arrive they're all excited and they've you know been rested for a couple of days because they've been traveling and things and there's a whole lot of enthusiasm they get on their bikes and they kind of like smash out the first couple of days and then day three they're wrecked. So the first thing before you know when you do get to the tours is just nice ease into it and just take the first days nice and easy. And you'll find that as you do that, you actually build yourself into form as you're riding through the tour, right? And of course, you know, there will be, or there may be a day where you just feel wrecked, you know, and that may happen. It certainly happened to me when I've been on big rides. It's like you come in maybe day four or day five. It's like you're just feeling pretty tired. So, you know, just 
take the easy option or get in the van or or do a bit of the riding and just have a bit of a bit of a rest recovery day listen to your body and just experience the ambience you don't necessarily need to be on the bike for the entire ride so you know certainly have have an approach to it just to make sure that you know <clears throat> you're getting a lot of enjoyment out of the tour all the rides that you're doing but just make sure that you're not really pushing yourself all the time all the way through them you know use the tours it's a holiday you know really mm. enjoy the experience so but training approaches the fundamentally you know the two most important things about training for these sort of tours is making sure that you do get some vertical meters into your training i mean it, it goes without saying but you know a lot of people they they don't focus on those vertical meters now strava and training peaks and those sort of applications can log you know when you're logging your data into it will track the amount of vertical meters that you're riding during the week and it's important that you do build up your training and and build up your ability to be able to climb long extended climbs of course we have our training camp in bright that we use to prepare people for uh, these tours it's been very successful and they get a, an understanding and they also get the mindset around the fact of what a long climb's like because when you get on things like Falls Creek and Mount Hotham and and uh, Mount Buffalo and you go over to Wonga Gap you get an idea of what a big long climb is going to be like and it just helps getting that mindset set we've just had our camp in November and it was fantastic we had some awesome weather and and uh, you know it's important to work through pacing yourself through those bigger climbs. So certainly, if you if you are training for some European climbs, you know do get yourself if you get the opportunity go into the bright region here and uh, you know in the state of Victoria, and ride some of those longer hills. I've just moved to Adelaide, so <clears throat> of course you know I'm heading for the Adelaide Hills. There's some fantastic climbing in the back of here. I know in New South Wales there's some fantastic climbing. Uh, when you go, you know, Kurungo Chase, a little bit further north of that, and over in Perth, you've got some good hills there, and they don't necessarily need to be as long uh, as these epic climbs like Mount Hotham and Falls Creek, but certainly do get some vertical meters into your climbing because the biggest difference between riding along the flat and riding up hills is that your cadence drops, and you've really got to train your legs to be able to do that. And you can do it on a home trainer as well. Obviously, it's not as effective. Uh, because it's very difficult to spend two or three hours on a home trainer for for you know for those extended periods of time, um, but and you can certainly do that on the road. But when you're on a trainer, just remember to drop your cadence a little bit. So I'm sort of talking you know 60 and 70, and certainly work on um, practicing standing up and uh, riding standing up and riding seated, and go out and hunt down some of the steeper gradients in your area some of the climbs for the steeper gradients and don't be afraid to ride up them and certainly like I mentioned before make sure you got the gearing sorted out on your bike so it makes it easier I mean I remember when we went over to Spain before we went over we changed on we had compact cranksets and we went to 32s on the back you know so we had an 11 32 cassette 11 speed and after I did that I haven't taken it off that was a few years ago and I just absolutely enjoy riding with that gear ratio because I can get up anything now you know being seated or standing and it's uh, so make sure you get the gearing sorted out now the other thing that's really important is keeping your training really consistent and getting the back-to-back -back training session so in a lot of our training programs and we've got one specifically for these events is to make sure that you get that Saturday and Sunday longer rides happening if you've got a schedule that you know if you've got the classic nine to five work week and then then the weekends you've got those two days available certainly by all means get out and do those two days and do some longer rides over those two days and back to back it and <clears throat> during the week keep that training consistent make sure you're riding you know three of those uh, five weeks during uh, five days during the week to help get that consistency happening with your training so but when you're over in Europe you're used to riding you know multiple uh, multiple days in a week um, if you're one of these people that's only riding one or two days a week when you get over to one of these tours you'll find it quite challenging because your body's just not used to be you know riding day after day after day after day so you know those are the really the two major tips um, around that so was there anything else that you wanted to add to that Paul no, you're spot on about the consecutive days the back-to-back -back nature of a tour mm. and needing to replicate that in some form during the training so like you said, long week, uh, the weekends is great. And they also could be, like you said, disappear to bright for a long weekend yeah. or somewhere where there is a, a little bit of a, or, or the Atapta Australia, no, the Atapta tour was just yeah, the other weekend. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, go away for a long weekend, pick an event, and also do some riding the day before and the next day as well. And yeah. Ride, ride for a long weekend, three or four days, and that will really help your body know what yeah. it feels like on yeah. the tour as well. Yeah. And, you know, if you've got the opportunity to get a little bit of time off during these, uh, you know, the season that we've got Christmas coming up now and New Year's, of course, you know, it gives the opportunity for us to get out and ride a little bit more. A lot of people come over for the Tour Down Under here in Adelaide. Uh, fantastic tour. opportunity for, you know, spending a week on the bike, just cruising around and giving your ideas. So, Angela, just around your question, you know, how do you uh, cater for different ride abilities on the tour? So that's probably a question for Paul. Uh, we'll probably come to that a little bit later on. But how, yeah, but how do you know that you're ready for a tour and the climbing? Well, I think it's important to get out there and try some of the longer climbs in your area and see how you go and just get comfortable with them. Um, and the, you know, the great thing about hill climbing is that the more you do of, do uh, of it, the better you get at it. You know, so once you get that consistency sorted out, and of course, if you need any help with any of that stuff, I mean, we've been coaching people for the last 12 years and uh, we're more than capable of helping you out with that. So if you're not already on one of our training programs or one of our custom programs, then certainly touch base with us and we can certainly help you out in, in helping you get prepared for those events. I can certainly have a look at your data within Training Peaks and see where you're at. Uh, and then we can go from there. So, um, yeah, yeah, with the consecutive days, you know, it yeah. doesn't mean you have to be out there riding three or four hours. It's wow. if you ride a couple of hours one day, then you can get three or four the next day, an hour and a half the next day. But just being able to do that for three or four days and, and do yeah. it in a block and then have a few weeks where you, you just ride your weekends or during the week a couple of times, like you mentioned, yeah. and then in a month's time, try it again for a few days and yeah. do that repetition a few times over a six month period and your body adapts really quickly. It's amazing how it, it you don't want to force it and rush it, but you, you spend some time and your body will adapt. It's really yeah. amazing. Oh, the body's amazing at adapting. But you're yeah. right about the gradients also. We have quite a few clients who have their local climb and it's normal. It's your local region. It's where you ride. It's all you can, it's what you can do. <laughs> But it might be a set gradient, constant, and you do that, and it's perfect. You've got to do the training. Mm. But also, it is great, like you said, go and look for something steeper because on a tour, we're riding day after day in a different region, a different climb, yeah. and not all climbs are set 6% for 8Ks or whatever. Sometimes yeah. you get a 100-metre ramp where it might be 15%, and if you haven't seen that before, you'll be cursing the guys. Why did you take us here? But if you know how to... To deal with 100 metres of getting over it, you yep. know how to stand up, like you mentioned, you've learned how to stand up on your bike. That 100 metres little ramp flies by and you're back on sitting down, enjoying the climb again. And Because every climb's different, you're going to get some flat sections, some steeper sections, some constant sections. So in your training, look for those variations as well. Don't just get on your comfortable climb that you can do day in, day out. Look for something new as well just to test yourself a little bit without yeah. going over the top. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I mean, here in Adelaide, we've got the corkscrew and there's some fantastic steep stuff down in Bel Air. Um, you know, mm. when I was in Mansfield, we had old Tommy Road that we used to ride up. That's some fantastic steep sections in it. It was fantastic to get up. And, you know, you can find those things in your local area. I'm sure there's some short, steep, punchy stuff that you can get onto. Um, and if you can't find those things, then ride up, you know, the, the climbs that you're doing in one or two gears harder than you would normally do and that'll lower your cadence and simulate uh, the steeper gradients as well so extra tension on the legs yeah, yeah. a little bit of because you know you, your muscles don't understand cadence but they do understand force so it's important to when you lower your you know when you make your gears harder it uh, lowers your cadence and it means you've got to apply more force to your pedals and that simulates steeper gradients so you know it's a really 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 good thing that you can do Fantastic. Yeah, one right. other thing, David, with the training, I think is, yeah, you hear all, a lot of coaches and stuff talk about periodization. Mm. For example, at the moment here in Europe, I'm in the off season, so I'm taking a bit of a back seat to the cycling, was really busy. And yeah. so now I'm keeping generally fit with some other activities, some hiking, some swimming, and yeah. probably mid-January I'll start to ramp up the cycling yeah. again. But it is important also not just to smash yourself day after day, have a bit of a break, find some other activities that you're interested in. Keep riding, but yeah. you don't have to be always at the top of your game. It's no. important, I think, to look at your year. Oh, I've got that 
tour perhaps or a grand yeah. fondo or something coming up in yeah. three months i'm going to start i've got the base i'm going to now start doing this so i haven't got the base yet i better start six yeah. months before and that's really important for the coming on a tour as well oh yeah, because yeah. it's not all about um yeah. Yeah, being at the top the whole time. You need to go down a little bit at times to come back up and, and, yeah. and improve. Absolutely. Yeah, and I totally agree with that. I mean, we've got, you know, we, we work with a lot of our athletes on working with their seasonal seasonal planners for their seasonal year and they put in stuff that they're going to be doing and we work on, okay, well, this period we want to work on strength and we want to work on your aerobic build here and then we want to work on specific stuff closer to the event. And so, yeah. you know, we do a lot of planning. And the other thing around just, you know, hill climbing techniques and stuff, you know, we spend a lot of time working with our athletes you know, on the home trainer, uh, doing dr specific drills to develop uh, really good technique uh, and efficiencies at climbing hills as well. So, you know, a lot of indoor training videos that come with our training programs walk through those techniques and you get to practice, you know, standing up on the bike and spending extended time, spend uh, extended time standing up and you spend time working on lower cadences that simulate those steeper gradients. So we can do all that training uh, even on the home trainer to help improve that. And then when you get out on the road and you start riding out on the road, uh, you find that those techniques that you've developed uh, on the home trainer translate really well onto the road and suddenly you're riding up these hills a lot easier and more efficiently and those sort of things. So, so just uh, take that into consideration as well. And so, I, well um, can I ask one final yeah, thing? Sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I think also with training, it's not one approach that fits everybody either, is it? Because we're all different. We're, we are all different. We've got different yeah. backgrounds, different capabilities, yeah. different this or that. But for me, I know that uh, I'm lucky because I do do eight to ten tours a year and you get that back to back so you can have a couple months off and you get yeah. back on the bike and in a week you're feeling good again. That's that's not normal though. That's lucky. <laughs> that's lucky. But I also one day, know one day I'm going to retire and I'm going to go over to Europe and I'm just yeah. going to do every single tour. I'm going to fly over there in March and I'm just going to be hanging out with you, Paul, until we finish we'll up. We'll <laughs> have to <laughs> extend onto the house, will we? Too? Yeah. <laughs> right so yeah, that. I know now with a few young kids that I've really got to time my, my my riding as well. So I always have got a good base. That's mm, fairly yeah. lucky there. But I also know that more or less a month before a tour, if I've got to up the ante a little bit, I start to just pick. I've got a one kilometer mountain bike gravel track and a one k asphalt road, and I start like, the first time maybe only doing three or four repetitions intervals but by the end of the month i've sort of got it up to eight or ten and i'm feeling good and able to constantly hit the same time i don't try and race any of them just hit the same time each time and then i start to have this inner confidence as well because everybody needs to feel confident and the guides as well and then by that stage i know i'm ready for a tour but yeah everyone's probably got at least a one kilometer climb somewhere when they feel they want to do some special little interval type stuff as well to get themselves ready yeah. i think a bit of strength yeah. fantastic yeah totally agree so angela i know you've got another question about um catering for different rider abilities we'll answer that in the uh, questions and answer session so just hang to the to the end and harry again your question about uh um the multi-day sustained long climbs in europe's and you know what's per kilogram uh, we'll answer that in the questions and answer. So um, we'll get to that very soon. All right. So, so we talked a little bit about training approaches. And of course, if you've got any other questions that you want answered in this webinar, you know, like I mentioned, I hate for you to get to the end of the webinar and feel like you haven't got anything out of it. So certainly by all means, take the opportunity tonight to ask those questions and we'll do our very best to answer them. All right. So, all right. So training approaches and then we'll just go to the next one. So general tour preparation tips. I'm going to hand this one over to you, Paul. Because I know that you've had a lot of experience with people rocking up with your tours uh, in all different uh, levels of um, preparation and stuff. So, what are some of the major things that you think are important for people rocking up to your tours? Yeah, I mean, these are this is no rocket science or anything like that. They're more sort of observations. Having been, you know, nine years doing cycling guiding through Europe, you you get to ride and talk and chat along the road and have fun with a lot of different people. So. There's times there when I'm, I'm riding along and, I'm, and the days are going by and, and there's riders who are just, again, either maintaining a great level or maintaining their normal level or getting stronger. And you start asking questions and, you, oh, okay. One of them's had, 
you're doing really well. What's what have you been doing to prepare? And I tell you, the daily commuting, the people who ride their bike to work, mm. and you find out that they're not riding long distances. They're wow. maybe getting a seventy or eighty k ride in on the weekend only because they're busy lives, but they're doing. 20 to 40 Ks a day, 15 or 20 Ks each way to, yeah. to work, Monday to Friday. And their bodies are just well equipped and ready to ride day after day. And they just get oh, yeah. stronger because their bodies work. So one thing, if you can somehow find the way of being able to commute to work on a bike and it's safe and it's enjoyable and you've got the facilities to be able to do it, I'd say start doing it because it's a great way to, to prepare yourself. Absolutely. Never underestimate the power of base training. I mean, I tell a lot of my clients that it's very important and it really comes back to me talking about that consistency, you know, get that consistency happening with your riding and, you know, the magic will start happening. Absolutely. Yeah. So, no, it's a really good point, Paul. No, thanks for uh, bringing another, that up. Another observation we have is, and it's a, coming back a little bit to yours, about understanding your body, understanding your level of condition for the climbing factor because... Yep. Uh, so many people come on, on, on tour at the start and they are, it's amazing. It's a dream year in this amazing location. You've been watching people, pros ride up these climbs and the idea, the temptation is to, to rush off on the first kilometre and at times we like to explain, please don't do that, to pace yourself and the like or this first climb starts steeper, make sure you get to there, the middle eases out, you get a chance to recover. We do all those briefings and explanations but... It is easy still to to jump off, jump the gun a little bit, and but no, listen, pace yourself. Uh, the first kilometers guide, and if you've got something where you do feel you've got some extra energy, you save that for the last two or three k's. That's still ten or fifteen minutes probably of work. So it, it doesn't yeah. sound like much, but ten or fifteen minutes. And if you want to give yourself a bit of a challenge. You're going to have already done a lot of work to get to that point. And if you want to just try and tip yourself over the edge or get that experience of, of how it might feel on these mountains, that's when you do it, not at the start. That's sort of, I guess, one of the, the main tips. And you can practice that in your training at home before you come yeah. along as well. Yeah, fantastic. <clears throat> All right. Uh, another one we've already mentioned about the bike setup, obviously vital. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, you just have to look at Morti Roller Climb in, in Italy in the Giro and you see all these uh, GC riders, general classification riders, jumping off their bike and getting a triple chainring bike to take one of these climbs on. These are some of the ridiculous European climbs. They're not yep. normal, but why not, like you said, grab compact cranks, 32 yep. on the rear cassette. You won't be using it all day, but when you need to, it's there, enjoyment, yep. and you can still... Yep click down and, and work in a, in a 28 or a 25 if you want to do yeah. some extra work as well. It's, it's, it's just having that luxury of being able to call on that, that extra gearing if you need it, and that's, that's a great way to, to come on, along on a trip. And all our higher bikes are set up in that configuration, yep. and usually you know, it's a 50-50. When you come on an explorer tour like this, you want to be comfortable, and so people want to often ride their own bike, but if they're doing extra travel before or after and, Lugging around uh, luggage, sorry, yeah, transporting luggage can be difficult through train yep. stations, airports. There's the higher bike option, so you'll get that gearing if you want it. Yeah. yeah, and we've when we've travelled over to Europe, when we've done our travelling before the tours, which we do, we generally go to an area like when we did um, the tour this year to the French Grenoble, Alps. We, yeah. yeah, we we were uh, in London for a whole week. Uh, and we um, we just left our bikes and our bike bags in the hotel room and uh, that was fine because we were based uh, just on the outskirts of London and that worked really well for us. Before when we were travelling, when we were doing point to point uh, through Italy uh, a few years ago, we actually took our bikes to uh, the airport storage. Uh, I can't remember which uh, Jody or no, but um, we actually that you can store your bikes and uh, and various other 
items <laughs> of luggage. Oversized at, equipment. Yeah, oversized stuff at the airport. Uh, they've got lockers there, and certainly in Italy, that's what we did. We uh, there's a time limit. I think you can't store it for anything more than seven days or something. But do do some research around some of the local airports that you're flying into, and see whether you can leave your bikes there. And that's certainly what we did. So yeah. most of them are really good now. You can keep them in for multiple long stays, and it's yeah. once you're getting to that week or longer, it's often fifteen euros a day. It comes out not too it's bad. Really cheap. Yeah, in it's, the end, really it's cheap. pretty good. Yeah, and you take your bike over, and it's fantastic riding your own bike over there. And we just use the, the bike bags, and they transport really well. Um, you know, the tip is to make sure that your rear derailleur is over, you know, pulled off your bike so it doesn't get, you know, knocked, or you actually shift it into a into the space where it's not sitting on the outside of the bike, that's actually sitting closer yeah. into the inside of the bike. And that way, less chance of it getting knocked and your rear derail hanger being broken. And we always take spare rear derail hangers, but we've never had any issues with that. So, yeah, the airlines tip. are pretty good. Yeah, the airlines are pretty good. So no, The rear derailleur is a good tip. Look yeah. after that and, and bring the spare hanger because when we get... On tour, we, you know, every bike brand has a slightly different configuration on their hanger. And so uh, yeah. at times when that has come across and been broken, yeah. we're often really busy the first day or so trying to find a local bike shop that can yeah. help us there. Obviously with the hire bike, no dramas. But when yeah. you bring your own bike, look after that. Yeah, I'll think yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah, the rear derailleur hanger. If you can get a rear derailleur hanger for your bike, certainly, and you're traveling a lot, it's a really good, um, you know, investment. It's a really good insurance. Yeah, and we've and never had to use them, but no. you know, if, if we, uh, if, yeah, but if you know, if we ever have a problem, they're there. We always have them in the bike bags, so they're always there. Yeah, but anyway, digress. No, if we have to look at it on every say ten bikes that people bring along on a trip, bring their own bike, and it's traveled from Australia, New Zealand. One out of ten will have something, and it might be minor, it might be that, or it might be we've had a damaged rim on a wheel, or yeah. or a back stay is broken, and that's obviously really a bad one, unfortunate. Yeah. But yeah. probably one out of ten still is the statistic that something yeah. might yeah. happen. Oh, so yeah. it, lucky that yeah. we've done a lot of travelling and yeah. we've had no issues with uh, the bike. Yeah, obviously the box, the way you pack yeah. it up has a big yeah. influence as well yeah. you've probably got you've got lots of experience of that so that helps yeah. so yeah yeah, yeah. fantastic so what about the other thing because quickly is 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 clothing i think um, i was going to say we that. Are in summer we are riding european summer but we are in the high alps a lot of the time yeah. so with the support van that's great because you can always carry a backpack with two sets of clothing or three if you need it there's no drama put as much in as you like but bringing something for wet weather and cold weather on the top of the climbs is important to have if you want to descend comfortably. Yeah. Um, sometimes also it's amazing that people really uh, haven't got a great set of nicks and chamois for, and they're comfortable in. Mm. Often we talk about all this training and being ready for yeah. the tour, but usually it's not the training that people then have problems to sit out a day. It's usually they've got unfortunately a sore bottom to put it mm -hmm. nicely and that's yep. because they haven't had the a good pair of nicks or or the like and they're really sore and they actually have to take a rest day and they could be riding but because yep. of the the gear that they're using that's uh, an issue and again we have really on our bikes great salatalia saddles and the like which are great quality but at the same time your body's used to some sitting on your saddle so if you know you're prone to that well bring your saddle along and we'll fit it onto your bike. Yeah. And that way an external factor is not keeping you off the bike. Or yeah. off the yeah. tour. Fantastic. Um, sickness, we're talking again about training. Look yeah. after yourself before the tour. Oh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, um, everyone's the same. To get away for a holiday with the pressures of work, the final days of work, you're just doing double, triple time. Then you jump onto the plane. You're dehydrated, cabin pressure. Yep. You, sometimes oh, people come on to, or arrive on the tour and they're actually the first couple of days are a bit sick. But if you arrive, give you maybe arrive a day or two earlier yep. as well. Yep. But be conscious before the tour that you need to look after yourself as well. Yeah, definitely. Because often yeah, this is the fact these external factors are playing mm. more havoc, to put a word, in not feeling great on tour than the actual lack of training or whatever you think you might be worried about now. It's often other things that are uh, causing the difficulties. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. And sore lower back. And that's yeah. That's what we see. If people, if anyone's got an issue, okay, you might you're getting tight and tight in the legs, but when you when you start to get the sore lower back and you're climbing, yeah. that's when things start to feel tough. Yeah. Mentally, it starts to get to you, and, and yeah. so we do. If we see anything on the trips where people are starting to struggle, often it's yeah. sore lower back, and that can just be easily eradicated. Start doing if you don't already, start doing some core work. Yeah. And, and learn to stand up, learn to mix your positioning, and, 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 and you're away. So they're just general tips, which I think yeah. can, can help yeah. the overall experience. Yeah, and all our training programs, and we understand the major importance around that. Not only does it help with your technique, but with um, you know, your ability to be able to sustain power for longer yeah. periods of time, which is critically important for hill climbing. So we've always incorporated, you know, our off bike strength training program as part of all of our training programs, and it's a core fundamental. So you're absolutely right, Paul. It's like the core strength stuff's really super important. And you know, the body maintenance, like I mean, you know, yoga and stuff like that's just really important to get that flexibility happening. So yeah, it's all really good. All right, so we'll get on to uh, base to point to point. We're uh, coming up to about coming up to the hour, so we are going to run over the hour a little bit, but we'll try to wrap it up pretty quickly. So this, one I want, yeah, yep. this one I want to talk too much because I think we've been generally talking about it. But yep. the the with a pro race tour, mm. with the way the stages move and having access to the race, we always try and get a minimum of two nights. But in a pro race tour, there might be just because of logistics, the need to have a one night and then you get yep. a couple of nights later. But mm. that's sort of the difficulty times to get a cycling base the explorer we're always looking for two to three nights in all yeah. locations which is great yeah and then there's point to point which is obviously depending on people who like to and point to point can be great for those who do their own self-guided trips because they get their bike they're carrying limited luggage they're experienced at doing that and they just mm-hmm. like that moving exploring day to day and it's probably depending on how you like to travel Mm, it dictates mm. a lot of that, whether you're going to be a base or a point to point. And just quickly for cycling bases in Europe, in Spain, Granada is a great base. Play in Mallorca is another good base. Costa Brava, just north of Gir- uh, Barcelona, Girona is a great base. If you wanted to just pick a spot for four or five nights. Uh, in the French Alps, you've got Saint, uh, sorry, in Pyrenees, you've got Saint Larry, Soulon, Argelles. In the French Alps, Le Bourg d'Orsan or Saint Jean de Maurienne are great bases. In Italy, you could go to Cortina d'Ampezzo in the Dolomites. We mentioned Bormio before is a great base near the Stelvio. Um, yeah, there's they, these are. I mean, if anyone wants any more information, feel free to send David an email, and he can flick yeah. it through to me, and I can yeah. give more information by email yeah. at any yeah. time. Because we also yeah. help people who are not after a tour, just self-guided, and we can design their itinerary and routes and accommodation options, and it's this is based on a fee approach. It doesn't have to because we know there are people who do like point-to-point point and they're looking yep. for some assistance, and we're happy to yep. help because the more people cycling, you know, we're the cycling lovers. We just like to help yeah. in general, so it's good. Fantastic. Yeah, I was going to say that, Paul, because I know that you, you do that, offer that service, and... Um, you know, if anybody's got any questions around particular areas, I mean, Paul's just a fantastic resource to tap into. So you can obviously go onto his uh, website and uh, fill in a contact us form, or yeah. you can go onto our website and just mention that you wanted some information about tours over in Europe or some areas to stay or whatever, and uh, we can just, certainly help you yeah. out there. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Any help, any help fine yeah, for we us. Love, yeah. <laughs> absolutely love people riding their bikes. That's what we're about. So definitely. All right. So uh, question and answer time. So, um, so Angela, uh, I'll, I'll get um, Paul to answer your question about how you manage. I know how we do it on our training camp. Mm-hmm. We uh, manage rider ability uh, very well on our training camp. But Paul, how do you manage rider ability on your on your tours? No, it's a great question because we're going to come on a, on a tour and there's going to be people who are, you know, at the moment it's about 70% male, 30% female proportions. But about if you looked at the overall... As well. yep. Yep. And then you look at our last two years with Pyrenees and Dolomites, it's actually on three of the five latest trips, there's actually been more women than, than wow. men. So 
that's that husband and wife seem to like the explorer style as well because it's a good way to ride together, do some yeah. challenges. But to keep, we always are going to come on a tour to the public with different levels. And, and yeah. our job as guides is to be really professional about that. And the first ride is always like a welcome ride, 30 to 50 Ks, nothing too taxing. And we can get a really good feel straight up as to who we've got in the group because we could roll out Pyrenees, the same itinerary year after year, but no one tour will be ever conducted the same because yeah. our job is to, to work in with the group that we have at hand. Yeah. And so we'll and, always and have the weather support. as well. And the weather. Yeah. Yeah, the weather. Yeah. And so we have the support bands with professional guides. We have front guides. We, depending on group sizes, we'll have a uh, back rider. If not back rider, the back support band. It's always a one guide to five ratio. So it's always really intimate. So by having that means that we always can look after different abilities on long climbs. And if we have the option, sometimes we get one of the guides to take out the stronger riders to do the first climb a little half an hour earlier. So they start getting some work done first. If we know that other riders are capable of doing the climb or two climbs, but they're going to be a bit slower, we give them the option maybe to leapfrog and start earlier. If some are a little bit sure if they can do the whole climb, we might give them a three or four K head start on the climb. This is all the communication because yeah, yeah, we don't yeah. just say this is necessarily what you have to do. We talk through the options, give the briefing the night before, also in the morning if the conditions have changed, etc. And that way, just by doing it over nine years, we're able to all you know almost time it so everyone's getting to the top at a very similar time. Regroup. If someone does arrive 10 to 15 minutes earlier, well, they're in just the most amazing landscape, so yeah. they're not going to, they usually don't have any issues. Yeah. And our job as guides is to facilitate and create a group camaraderie and environment that mm. feels like family and everyone's there to help. Well, it's yeah. a holiday, there's challenges, oh, yeah. yes, but we try to create this mm, friendship. And many people we see after the tour, they go to Adelaide, they go to Sydney, they go to Perth, and they link up and you get photos sent to you of them riding together. So yeah. when you create that friendship, all of a sudden it doesn't matter so much if someone does have to wait a little bit at the top. We do our yeah. many methods to get it to, to co coincide, but then yeah. descending is always safety first together. Yeah, safety first. The, yep. the, that's our philosophy, safety first, because... You haven't descended on these roads before. You don't know where the tight closed hairpin is. You don't know that it turns a little bit the asphalt into some bumpy stuff here or whatever. And our guides, our job is to look after you from start to finish. So yeah, fantastic. Some of the, some of the concepts there. Yeah, no, that's been really good. And I know the tours that I've been on with Epoor, it's been really awesome. And, you know, the flexibility is great because, you know, we have had something that's been planned previously and then we look at the weather or we look at what the group's doing or we look at the, you know, fatigue of the group. And I know you're always assessing that and it's like, you know, you provide us with options around what we can do uh, within that area. And it may not necessarily go to plan, but, but the thing is that we get to maximise the experience. And I suppose that's the most important thing is you want to get out there and maximise the experiments, the experience and the enjoyment, you know, of, of what you're riding through. So, you know, it's fantastic that you do yeah, allow the yes. tours to be nice and flexible around that. So, yeah. you know, and you and being accommodating, you know, that's that's been fantastic. So, so obviously um, this yeah. is we live and breathe. This is our core, this yeah. is our business. So uh, is it, our job as guides is not to say, oh, there was a hundred Ks on the itinerary today. Oh, <laughs> we've got to do that. No, no, no. It's not this is not our holiday. <laughs> this is this is our guests, our clients' holidays, and yeah. the whole focus yeah. is that yeah. maximize experience is a great way to put it. Mm. That's what we're about, making sure the group as a whole mm. is getting the best out of of their the ability, the weather, their experience that they're looking for, and we yeah. work really hard to to do that. Yeah. Yeah, really accommodating. Fantastic. All right, so Harry, the last question for you. Okay, so um, for me, it's not really necessarily around what's per kilogram. Um, around the rides. Generally, you want to look at, you know, you want, it depends on how you ride in the climbs and stuff, but, um, what I, what I recommend to most of my riders is the first couple of days you want to be, you know, sitting sort of the top end of V1, okay, in your power zones. Now, if you need any help with that, Harry, we can take that offline rather than me explain all of that because we'll need another five minutes to go through it. 
but you generally want to you know work around that E1 so you're working more aerobically for the first couple of days that's not to say that you can't punch out and do a little bit of E3 and VO2 max stuff on the climbs and things but the idea is just to sort of get working on that base and stuff and just easing yourself into it and then when you're out on the ride you may take a particular climb you may be feeling quite good and you just want to hit one of the climbs pretty hard I know when I got to do Alp Duez, you know, I sort of, I rode up it, I didn't, I rode up it sort of at a tempo sort of pace, um, but for the rest of the climbs I was just sort of riding tempo, but you know, there were a couple of climbs where I just um, would ride them quite hard and um, and enjoy that experience and it was fantastic that Paul gave me the opportunity to do that when we did the Dolomites, uh, sorry, no, sorry, the what was the tour? I'm just, Dolphin A. Dolphin A, sorry, starting with D. The French, the Dolphin French A. Language. Yeah, yeah, the Dolphin A. Um, you know, and uh, just to head out on a couple of the climbs and just have a, have a really good ride, really nice, hard, solid head out on those. And so, um, so to answer your question, you want to mix it up a little bit, but generally you want to use, as a base, you want to use the top end of E1 as, as the starting point, and then from there you can ride sort of up above that, but most of the riding you want to do sort of in that area, um, unless you want to ride it really hard, but even being, even saying that, you, you, you won't be able to sustain sort of, you know, E3 for uh, for any period of time. And I'm a big fan of getting um, getting variation in your training. You know, the E2 zone's not, not a, a super efficient zone for training in, so you kind of want to target sort of E1 and then E3 uh, when you're riding these sort of tours. So riding sort of E1 most of the time where you're able to hold a conversation with the person beside you mm -hmm. for majority riding, then, you know, punch it up into E3 and a little bit of VO2 max. It's when you're breathing hard and breathless and breathing hard um, uh, and not being breathless. So, um, you know, those sort of zones are great for just punching out on some of the some of the climbs where you feel it. So I hope that answers your question. And Angela, I hope that's answered your question as well. I hope we've covered that all off for you. Um, so I think that's, oh, well, we've got the offer, haven't we? Let's finish off of the offer. Yeah. Can't, well, can't uh, not have the offer. So, Paul, tell us about the offer. Well, it's, as you know, the last two years, the, the, the 250 euro offer for anybody mentioning cycling in form has just has been the standard offer. So, yeah. that's one that we'll just continue to roll out because it's yeah. been great that people have been able to take advantage of that. Yeah. And we have uh, until Christmas Eve, until 24th of December, we'll happy to double that up which means we can give a 500 euro discount if somebody comes along and brings also signs up their partner or a friend yeah. and that way both people will get a fantastic deal as well so yeah. that's going to yeah. that's all you have to do is say cycling inform double up on that and yeah. we know to take a, into account that there's going to be your booking form and a friends or a partners and we'll take it from there with the, the discount Fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's a great deal. Now, you obviously accommodate for riding and non-riding partners. I mean, I've always gone over to these tours with Jody, and she's on her bike riding, and it's been fantastic to share their holidays together uh, on the bikes. You know, it's, it's just it's just awesome way to share some time with your partners. But I know some partners uh, don't want to ride their bike, so you obviously accommodate it for that as well, Paul. Yeah, there's certain trips where we do have a private group or two or three sets of partners and we can design a really set alone plan just for the non cyclists. But if there's just one or two and they're and they're coming along to join and often they'll come on the, into the van for sure. But we also with having bases for two or three nights, we organize cooking classes, uh, a guided hike to, to a beautiful location. Yep. Uh, we can do other activities based on the interests, uh, mm. bakery class we did in France this yep. year. So we can do uh, different activities based on the interests yep. of the non-cyclists and that's just, yep. again, open dialogue. What do yep. you want to do? Yep. Are you interested? Yep. There'll be certain days where we will have a transfer day logistically wise in the van. but mm. And there's some non-cyclists who are just happy in the van all day because they want to be taking photo and video of their loved one all day and that's, they love it. But then there's that combination where we are able to work for non-cyclists. And, yeah. and I think what's testimony to that is we now have some travel agencies because we've been doing this for nine years in Australia who actually ask us to design just general tours in, in Spain, France and Italy just for general tourism because we know all the great wineries, yeah. the underground caves, the walking trails, 
restaurants. We know all these and nice luxury accommodation, bed and breakfast accommodation. We know all these areas now that people are asking us to just design their own general travel, travel uh, tours as well. So as a non-cyclist, they can rest assured they're going to get a really good experience still, even though they're not on a bike. And we have to, we, there is usually a discount of sorts because there's not all the cycling gear and the, and the food and drink during the things. But depending on extra activities that they do take on, it could be some variations. But there is def definitely usually a saving to be made. Yeah. It just depends on how yeah. many extras they want yeah. to look on as well. So, yeah. Fantastic. That's awesome. Fantastic. Well, look, um, we'll start wrapping it up now. Uh, firstly, I wanted to thank you for taking the time out. I know people are running around with their pants on fire at the moment leading into Christmas and the news and stuff. So I really appreciate you taking the time out and to learn a little bit about uh, some of the opportunities that you've got over in Europe. Um, and I hope this has inspired you and built a little bit of confidence within yourself that you can go out and do something like this. Uh, it's an amazing experience mm -hmm. to get out into Europe, to be riding on the other side of the road and to experience these climbs. And you really feel like you've gone to cycling heaven. You know, you, you're out on these roads and you're pinching yourself because they're just so amazing. And I just, you know, it's just it's just an incredible experience to, and something that you can do on the bike. It's, you know, you can take whatever riding you're doing and times it by 10 and that's what it's like. It's just an amazing experience to get out there. So I hope that this has inspired you to get out there. And of course, you know, if you have any questions around training leading up to these events or, or preparation or you or you want some information around areas that you can visit and the best opportunities the places and the rides and certainly use us you know e email us um, get in contact with us and let us know what you're thinking about and we'll certainly do our very best to help you out all right so um, and certainly if you've got any questions after this by all means fire them off so I just wanted to thank you very much and Paul thank you very much for taking the time out of your busy schedule with now because I know that you're pretty busy getting yourself prepared for next year no, it's been a pleasure, David. Always enjoy uh, talking about European cycling and cycling in general. So, yeah, like I guess a final word is, yeah, don't be if you are hesitant, uh, don't be hesitant because it's a tour, it's not a race. Um, basically, yeah. you see the pros going up Tourmalet, up to where's the breakneck speed, and they're suffering. Mm. But on a tour, you don't have to. You can ride instead of riding up up to in an hour in, in an hour or to, sorry, Tom in an hour, you do it in two and enjoy it and you'll be fine. It's just a matter of if you love cycling, if you love traveling and if it's a dream, then you'll be fine. That's that's yeah. half the battle then. Yeah, and Paul will look after you. He's, he's awesome that's, at yeah, that. That's so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well look, thanks very much again. Uh, all Thank the you. best. Ride ride safe. Um, have a have an awesome time and have a fantastic Christmas and New Year's. Uh, keep it safe out there. Don't get too sunburnt. And uh, I look forward to catching you either on a tour or catching up with you on email or whatever. We'll catch you soon. Yeah, Excellent. thanks, Dave. Cheers, right. man. Bye.